Welcome to another edition of Radio Legends from the city of Muskegon, Michigan. Uh, Today we're going to interview a gentleman that I've known for years. Uh, His real name is Walt Love, but you may know him better uh, on the radio at MUS and other stations as Chris Roberts. Uh, Welcome. Well, thank you, sir. And before we get into all this interview, we want to thank Oscar Osbo. He has kindly agreed to uh, do this videotape for us. Providing his facilities. Yes, his. providing his facilities. We uh, And just a quick note, we're also still in the process of um, setting up a radio historical exhibit at Lakeshore Museum. And Oscar and John Van Wyke and myself and many of our radio legends are part of this you know you graduated muskegon high school right uh 74 four okay yeah. and and i was about three years ahead of you right and uh when i was still there they had frank polling as the uh as the radio television teacher but who did you have because well, you had, retired uh, well that year. we had uh, mike vogus you had Mike Vogus. Mike Vogus, he took over the the radio thing because we had the, they called it WMHS. Okay. And first hour of the day, we produced a five minute thing that ran between first and second period. Oh. And I never did any announcing on it. I was the engineer on it. I edited. We had reel to reel tape, and recorded everything, and then I edited it all together. And I had to have it ready by eight fifty five. Wow. So, you know. And so I'd be walking between first and second period, which was a long ways in those days from the third floor of the corner of Muskegon High School, down three flights, through the old building, and into the tech wing, because I went to electronics class after that. Okay. So while I was walking, I was hearing my work done. And was that in room 310 of 310. Muskegon High School? Yes, That's was. where we did our yep. MHS morning news. That, that yeah. was what it was called, yeah. Yeah. But you never did the announcing. No, I never did. I did all the technical work, and wow. the last thing that... They said at the end was and Big Wally at the headset, so I would be you know, hearing my work as I was walking between classes, you know. Yeah, but that was fun though because ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to be on the radio. I was going to ask you that was my next question. Yeah. What got you interested? Just being listening to the radio forever. Now, did you have a favorite station? Chicago. You... I don't. Know, I listened to everything. Okay. I listened to Chicago, Milwaukee, True, and Muskegon. Yeah. Even the Grand Rapids, LAV and GRD AMs at that time. Yeah. I was always messing with the radio. You know? Okay. Thank God my dad had some good radios. You yeah. know. How old were you when you first went on the radio? <sighs> Twenty one. Okay. And yeah. what did what you but you were in electronics or something? Yeah, I got an electronics you? degree at MCC. Okay. And but I really didn't want to do that. I ended up doing that later, but I ended up uh, going to get. I said, well, I got to get on the radio somehow. Mm-hmm. So I went and applied to take what was back then an FCC third class license with which is what with a broadcast endorsement. Right. You had to have that to do transmitter logs. Right. So I drove to Grand Rapids, took the test, passed it with flying colors, walked into WTRU, and John London, the program director, says we don't hire people without experience here. Fine. I drive up the road to Whitehall here to a station called Super Q on 95.3. That's back in the day. And, and what year are we talking? It was, say, uh, spring of 77. Okay. And I walked in, and I walked up to the program director, who was Dan Mason at the time, or Daniel Boone, if you will. I remember that. Yeah. And uh, I said, hey, I really like your station. I really like a shot. I've already got my license. He goes, really? We need a part-timer. And there we are. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Long time ago. And uh, had you had any announcing experience no, prior none, to that? None, and so you just none. went on the radio. Like, I have some tapes. I, I have some tapes. They're pretty sad. You know? <laughs> <laughs> some old air checks. Though. Yeah, they're pretty sad. Oh, yeah. that's great. That's great. I, I don't have them personally. I know somebody that does. I don't know if he's ever going to give them back. You Are know? you talking so, about Dan Mason? No, I'm talking about a guy named Tom I know. Oh, okay. So anyway. Okay. But uh, that was my start. And then... Uh, I was there for a little while, left, came back, and then they had the big fire here. The place burned to the ground in February of 78. Okay. And I was off work for a couple months, and I got a call from Tim Actoroff at MUS. Okay. said, uh, somebody here says you you need some work, and I came in there. I did. I was doing, he hired me to do two weekend shifts and take care of public affairs during the week. So I had a full-time job at, at the Big M, you know. Yeah. Now, did you work 
on Maddie Wesley Davis. Oh yeah, one of the program. one of the many. Yeah. Yeah, and Maddie Wesley Davis, if you've watched the series of tapes, I think just about everybody that worked at MUS engineered her 45 minute pre-recorded show yeah she also had a 45 minute live show yeah, she did. on sunday which she did something like what was it two thousand sundays in a row yeah she, it was she a long was some time. remarkable she, record she holds right in the i think a lot of, of people Michigan. engineer but it was fun to engineer her show because yeah. she had so much fun doing it oh yeah you know and she was she truly was legendary right. Yeah. it uh, Okay, so you now are on MUS. You're working all kinds of different aspects of the station. Yeah. Then, what what evolved from there? Well, I think it, I don't remember the timeline exactly because that was like a long time ago. But I remember sometime in 1978, uh, I got uh, hired to do the overnight show full time. Okay. And that was back when you actually had to have people there, you know? Yes. So yeah. I did that for a couple of years, and I did 7 to Midnight for... I think four or five years. Okay. Then I went to middays, and Dan Mason left for uh, um, Reno, Nevada. And right. He's still out there. And well, uh, he just retired. And I became became the program director of MUS. Yeah. Okay. And that was on all that time. Then we moved out to the new facility by Mona Lake. Yeah. And then I went to South Bend, Indiana, for about a year and a half. And almost what you, two years. What did you do in South Bend? I put on a country station down there. You did. Yeah. Did you didn't engineer it or did no, you? No, I was program director. You were PD. It didn't exist. Okay. I mean, the frequency. Didn't and this exist is what here. town? This would have been in the summer of 1989. And what what city again? South Bend. South Bend. South Bend, Indiana. Yeah. yeah. All right. Didn't wow. exist. Station now, see, I didn't know that about yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Station didn't exist, and the next uh, rating period we had was the next spring. And we came in fifth in adults. Okay. Twenty five to fifty four in a station that I'm being on the year air wow. year, you know? And you just instantly had an audience. Yeah. Did because the only other country station there was an AM station. Okay. And, and you were FM. And we made them change formats within six months. No <laughs> so, kidding. Yeah, that wow. was that was fun. Now you were there two years. Why did Almost you two years. Uh well it was like a Wholesale bloodbath with the, I don't know, they just let a bunch of us go at one time. Oh, my God. Don't know why we never really, given a reason, that's radio. You know? Yeah, that is radio. So, uh, Tim hired hired me back. Okay. Yep. And there you were. And then how long were you there at that point? Uh, I worked, went back to MUS until 1994. Yeah. I came back as uh, Mike Majeski, our engineer, had left for Grand Rapids, so I became MUS's engineer. Okay. And I did a shift. Now, did so, you ever work on any of the other affiliated radio stations for MUS? Did you ever go up to Petoskey? At I did JML? go. Up, I did go up to Petoskey in the early 1984 when they changed formats. Okay. From uh, top 40 to adult contemporary. Oh. And I uh, took all their music and recarted cartridge on their redid their whole library. Okay. And Mike Majeski is with me, and he um, did some engineering work. We lived in the Holiday Inn in Petoskey for two weeks. Wow. Yeah, that was fun. Wow, okay. Yeah. So that's when they switched from their, what had been a highly successful. Top 40. Top 40 made lots of money. And then they switched to AC, I'm assuming due to format competition. It exactly, necessary. exactly, yeah. yep. Yeah, that makes sense. So by this time now, you are an engineer guy. Well, yeah, I kind of got back into that. And, and just for clarification for our audience, uh, engineers do what? With radio stations. Well, they maintain studios, maintain transmitter plants, okay. fix things that go broke. Now, you know? did you have to secure a first phone? Not in those days. FCC license? No, because in the mid-90s, the FCC dropped that requirement. Okay. So I could engineer directional AM stations, which I did. There were three of them in Muskegon. Okay. So I engineered 850 for a while and uh, 1520. Which, which was the old WKBZ. Right, and then 1520, which was the old. The old WKJR. Which was, uh, became WKBZ. It was really right. a convoluted stuff going on. Oh, yeah. But I was engineering those because uh, WKBZ was a four-tower directional. Right. And 1520 was three towers during the day and nine towers at night. Well, so, they went straight north-south, if yeah, I recall correctly. That, during I the, there during the day, they did. Yeah. I and at night they went straight months. north. So. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I did that, and then I uh, like you could hear them at the North Pole or something. No, I'm no, joking. I, I'm it's joking. It's very about possible, that. you know. <laughs> Finland, maybe. It was you know? AM, you know. Yeah, right. You know, a little skip, you know. So where do we end up here? Um, anyway. Oh, yeah. I left MUS in '94. Okay. To uh, do what? They got well. They got new management and everything. And uh, oh, is that the, when uh, Harvey took over? Uh, Harvey Netto. Yeah. 
No, that was when it was getting sold. Well, they hired a new general manager after Tim Actroff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, right. So the sales manager, Dave Weehy, and I went to 850 on Pondaluna Road. Oh, you to both KBC. left. We both left because oh, we kind of saw, what do you call it, the radio writing on the wall? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, I hear you. So we went over there, and I did that. I was operations manager and chief engineer there. Okay. Then I left and did my own engineering business for a few years, went back to 850 when a local group bought it. Okay. And then I left radio in 1999. Did you officially retire well, from radio? Well, I, I retired on my own recognizance, if you yeah, will, yeah. because things were changing so much all the time. Because with the new telecommunications laws they passed in the 90s, you could buy and sell them all you want. Because years ago, when you bought a station, you had to operate it for three years before you could sell it. Mm -hmm. And when they changed those laws, you could just turn them over all you wanted to. You know. Okay. So I decided... I've had enough of this uncertainty and went to work for Motorola two-way service in Muskegon. Oh, okay. So that was the end of my radio. But I did stay in it, though. I did engineering work uh, for a station in Ludington uh, up until two years ago. Okay. Well, he sold okay. that. So Now, you're, you, tell me a little about, uh, and the reason I bring this up is low-power FMs have become kind of the thing you hear about so much. So yeah, yeah. Tell me, you're involved with some of that, aren't you? Some of that, yeah. I was involved with the startup of One Up in Heart with okay. one of my best friends. Is that Bob? Bob Simonson, yep. yeah. okay. And I uh, helped him out get that going. Uh, uh, several of us did. The late John Allen helped with that. I was going to say John Station and then John, in Whitehall. And right? John put one on in Whitehall. And Whitehall too. Montague, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I contributed a lot of my music library to him, and yeah. so I ended up contributing to that. So we had, we had a lot of fun doing it. And that. I heard that station musically sounds really great. Yeah, always has. It's got the but same for, it's got format. the same format as the one up in up in Hart. Yeah, yeah. But, but I heard that they uh, musically very very good sounding oldie station. Yeah, it is. It's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. The um, now let's let's revert back to something you've shared with me. You want you want to revert, huh? Okay. Well, <laughs> revert back to the days when you were doing all nights at MUS. Right. You told me something that you may have been uh, the uh -oh. only all night disc jockey ever who had a full commercial load to to put out on the air when you. were Oh, I was there. running when I was doing overnights at MUS. That place was so popular. Yeah. That we had. I was running as many commercials as they were during the day. Okay. I don't know if they put them there as overflow or said, you buy this package and we'll give you this. But I was running a full commercial load overnights. Okay. You know? Oh, yeah. That's crazy. And I, mean, I, had an incredible, I had an incredible audience, too. Yeah. Remember, I remember Tim Actroff came and showed me this letter that some guy wrote to the radio station that he heard an ad on the overnight show for some music company, and he went and bought himself, his wife, this really expensive home organ for her to play. And wow. he heard the ad on my show. On overnight? Yeah, overnight. Wow. And, and they, he, he printed that up and used it in sales. Oh, course, sure. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had packages at the time on MUS, uh, which I was in the sales department. Oh, sure. Yeah. And uh, which would sell 24-hour ad schedules. Right. And I, you would always have a client go, well, those aren't going to help. Yeah, but if we charge you based on regular rates, these are essentially uh, such a good deal that you you won't even feel it. But if you get if you reach somebody overnight, how are you going to be uh, losing? I mean, that's that's a great deal for you. Sure it is. And I uh, said these are packaged, so you're getting great prices per ads, and you're getting prime time, and you're getting you know evenings and all nights. You're getting the whole package, full exposure. You know. Well, that was part of the thing with with MUS. That, that I agreed with Tim Actoroff on, is that if you turn that radio station in at 2.30 a.m. or 2.30 p.m., you were getting the exact same product. Yeah, exactly. So it was consistent. Yeah, you know? absolutely. The formatics were the same. Everything was, we didn't, of course, didn't do cash call in the middle of the night and wake people up. Yeah, you know? right. so. <laughs> that's too bad. You should have. No, I'm kidding. So let's, did you get involved with TV on any level? No, no, never. You never did? Nope. Okay, I thought maybe you might have at some point. Especially I, watched, the, I watched a lot of it. Yeah, especially <laughs> on the engineering level. Nope. Now, Oscar is, is the person overseeing our video and audio for this interview. You worked with Oscar. Oh, a couple different places, I think. WKBZ, and then the second time I went back there, he was there. 
Okay. I, ne- I didn't work at uh, Sunny FM 104.5. I never worked there. Okay. But I did work with Oscar, and I've known him for, I don't know, forever. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's it's so funny. So many of the staff at MUS Radio either worked at WTRU or were offered jobs at WTRU Yeah. Uh, that they didn't end up taking. Well, a lot of um, people I know when I my first job in Whitehall here at, at Super Q. Oh, a lot of people were. A lot of here. people came, started there, and went a lot of other places. Yeah, they sure you know? did. Yeah. Well, yeah, boy, you could you could have a, a large group meeting. Yeah, people from there went to you know Houston and Reno and yeah. and uh, all kinds of places. Well, John yeah. Allen, we talked about, and right. Dan Mason, right, or Daniel Boone. Yeah, yeah, started up there, I think, didn't they? Yes, they did. And in fact, no, John actually started in Grand Rapids. Did he? Yes. Oh, yeah, he was from GR, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, that's right. The uh, he was at ZZM, I think. ZZM, WLAV, WGRD, LAV, all of them. Yeah, he was at all of them. them. And a lot of people think when they hear ZZM, they think of television. Right. But there was a ZZM radio. Yeah, ZZM FM. Yeah, Yeah. for years. Uh, Good radio station, good rocker. Yep, I know several people that worked there. In the 60s, yeah. yeah. Uh, That makes me think of Bob Moore, who, the late Bob Moore. And I was going to ask you about Bob, because I know you and I had gone up to Fremont to see him right, right. after after his motorcycle accident uh and he recently passed away but did he did you ever since you got into engineering so actively did you and he ever connect on that level a couple of, well i brought i used to bring him equipment to repair from Wellington. okay that got to the point where i'm going well i better get this have bob deal with this or yeah you know take me longer to deal with it than him because he's got everything there ready to go you yeah know, so yeah, yeah. But Bob, I met Bob Moore at my wedding reception in October of 1980. I remember Tim came with his wife, and he says, oh, I brought along my buddy Bob Moore. So that's how I met Bob Moore. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yep. My gosh. And then I I'd connected with him many years later and after that fact, you know. Because yeah. he, he worked in Los Angeles and New York, and he was gone Dallas. all those years in Dallas. Yeah, yeah. He Buffalo. worked for worked for CBS Radio for a long time. And he came up to a station that I managed in Duluth, right. which again was one of the affiliate stations, the MUS, right? Uh, that's owned by the same group. And he would come up there and had a great story about trying to take a large piece of equipment to the transmitter building and takes a step out. It had snowed. It was winter, which. It is most of the time in Duluth. Right. And he steps out and goes literally straight down. The only thing that didn't get in the snow was the equipment. Oh. Otherwise, he was like buried, you know, literally up to his shoulders wow. in snow. He said, I worked my way out of it and got it to the transmitter without wrecking the equipment. But uh, one of his pleasant memories, as I recall, okay. <laughs> that uh, we all talked about at his wake. Anyway, the... Um, could you could you share some of your thoughts of what you're seeing with radio today? How it's different, and again, this is part that might be used uh, for the the museum exhibit. What you see different today versus what we well, were in? I'll start off by saying I don't listen to terrestrial radio anymore. And when you say terrestrial, we're for talking the audience, about AM FM broadcast radio. Okay, I don't and listen to it anymore. You don't at all. There's nothing there. It's all homogenized playlist, corporate playlists, mm-hmm. and if I do listen to any terrestrial radio, it's probably uh, WGNA. I'm out of Chicago once in a while. Okay. But that's about it. You know, I have XM radio in my car. Yeah. It's good. I have it at home. It's like, why do I need to listen to all this other stuff? Okay. And there's no, no broadcast radio now has no appeal to me. That's how much it's changed, in my opinion. And, and when you say that, how has it changed? How well, would you compare the difference? It sounds like if you go to city to city... And you turn on radio stations, they all sound exactly the same. Okay. So I think they're all corporate playlists. Okay. And there's no individuality anymore. Yeah. And I go to this town and go, hey, this station's kind of cool. It's different than everything else. Yeah, I mean, that's gone, you know? Yeah. Right. yeah. So, well, I always think back that I thought what was unique uh, in the past was the fact that radio stations were locally owned. Right. Uh, didn't typically have or own several stations. They could, but they didn't typically do that. And the owners not only understood 
that this was the community they had invested in. Right. But they went to church in this community. They followed sports teams in this community. They were worried about the weather. They probably had kids in school. They in had community. kids in school. Yeah. yeah, they were active socially. You could say they were invested. You could say they were invested in the community. Exactly. Yeah. And if if you take a big chain of radio stations, that what are how big's iHeart or what do they call it now? Uh, iHeart is it iHeart? Yeah. Um, what was it called before? Clear Channel. Clear Channel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but how many stations do they have? Do you have any idea how many? Twelve hundred or more. Yeah. A so lot, yeah. so if if the guy that runs it, I think isn't it out of Indianapolis or something like that? Um, does he does he have the same amount of emotional investment in the community? I kind of doubt. I kind of doubt it. That, you know. You know. That's my personal opinion, but I kind of doubt. But I I still know people that are in it that work for these big huge chains and they're looking to leave you know yeah, so yeah. yeah and and let me ask you an odd question this occurred to me recently um if you're 16 years old and you're like you and i were and we wanted to be in radio when we were kids i don't think that's a thing anymore yeah my question is how do you do that today i knew i do know a gentleman uh that teaches radio at grand valley yeah they used to be a former program director yeah and he still has full classes he says okay so he's trying to do the right thing there you know yeah so where so they they go to school they they demonstrate some ability right some talent and now they want to get in to be they want to go work at a radio station how does one do that today? i don't know i can't i can't speak to that because, i don't know you know it's like say from my story i just got lucky and walked into the white hall station says i I have an FCC license. Uh, uh, do you have any openings? That's how I got in. But yeah. I, you would never see that today. I don't think. Yeah, I mean, how does you that... don't need you don't need that anymore because the rules have been relaxed so much. Yeah, that you, nobody reads transmitters anymore. Right. In fact, if there are transmitter readings, they're automated to a hard drive somewhere. Which you know? which raises a really interesting question. What have you seen as an engineer? in terms of the changes from the 70s and 80s and 90s with the FCC to today? Well, back when I started, you had to take transmitter readings every hour, mm -hmm. you know, and, and all that song and dance, and, and then they relax that to every three hours. Then it's pretty much, I think, people still do them, but I don't know if there's a, I don't I can't speak to the legality of it anymore. Yeah. If they have to do it or not, I don't know, you know. Somebody had told me the FCC is the, in terms of personnel, is the smallest branch of the federal government. I have no idea. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Is and and that they're budgetarily limited now compared sure. to what they were. Did you ever interact or ever have to meet with somebody from the FCC? No, I career? never had anybody show up because back when they had staffed field offices all over the country, they could they could legally show up anytime you were broadcasting. Right. I never encountered an FCC guy. I, cause I remember there was, uh, when they would show up at one station in town, though, they'd call every other station and say, the FCC's in town. Right. You know, so, yep. But I never had to go through an FCC inspection, ever. I actually had a situation. I was 18 years old. As briefly, brief couple months, I worked at WQWQ. Okay, it's 1971. The entire staff was out of the building, and I was doing, normally I did nights. I'm now doing afternoons. That one day. And the entire staff has gone for a promotion that they're doing outside of the station. And this guy shows up from the FCC because they had just signed the station on like a couple months before. So I run to the door and I open it and I said, come on in. And I run back to the studio because I've got to change records and play ads and so on. And long story short, he, I had to run back to the door because he wouldn't come in. Oh. So finally he says, hi, I'm from the FCC. And I'm going, I'm like, I'm 18, man. And I've right. been in radio like three minutes in my what? career, right? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And now what do we do? And he, he, I said, well, sir, please come back to the studio. He did. And I explained that nobody was available. And this was before cell phones. I couldn't pick up a phone and call the boss and say, the FCC's here. He said, I want to see your public file. I said, I have no access. The office is closed. I wouldn't know where to get it. This is what's going on. You know, I told him, my, he said, let me check your transmitter readings. Have you been keeping them up? Which, of course, I did. So I got, I was okay. But the point is, 
that isn't happening today, is it? Not that I, well, it does happen probably somewhere, but I haven't heard of it in a long, long time, you know. Real quick question, just a off the wall thing. Pirate radio. I hear about it all the time. I would personally love to put on a pirate radio station. An illegal somewhere. radio station? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you would, huh? I would love to do that. You admit I, and you're admitting it. I will never <laughs> I will never do it. Oh, okay. But I would love to put on like a a one watt right. FM station. Well, you know station, the way the, the you know. way the way the FM dial is so loaded now with low power FMs. Yeah. And everything in the there's they have like there's a 949 low power FM in Grand Haven and there's one in Grand Rapids. And it's like you get by out by Coopersville on the highway and they're battling each other. Okay. And you know, so there's a lot of the rules are really relaxed for that stuff. Yeah. So the, if you notice, if you go up and down the FM dial now, it's loaded mm-hmm. with stations. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's about the, the terrestrial listening I do is I go up and down the band once in a while to see if I can hear something. It's all just the same. And the dial's so full of stations now, there's really no empty space anymore. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. I remember years ago we were up and I had a radio station in Iron River, Wisconsin that my partners and I had built back in the mid-90s. You know about that station. And same thing. We went to Iron Mountain, Michigan and thought we'd maybe try to look at putting a radio station up there. Right. Only to find out the entire FM band was full. And that was in the mid-90s. In the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. In the Michigan. UP. Yes. Yeah. Crazy. So... I hear what you're saying. Right. Yeah. And now with low power FMs, it's even right. more full. Well, I can remember a, a fun radio story that involves you. Sure. Second. Not that we're here to talk about, you know, my, my No, that's all right. It involves me too, you know. Yeah. So, yeah but there was, I think it was the fall of 84 on election night. Oh, I'm yeah. doing seven to midnight on MUS. Yeah. And it was a big, I think there was like, Governor and Senate, and all, I think it was a presidential election. Maybe well, it too. was uh, four. Yeah, yeah, it would have been. And yeah. so we, Tim Actroff, had hired Bill Trapp, yep. the old news guy at True, yep. to do election returns, which was a big deal. And you were, you were, Bill Trapp and was, you were uh, introducing Bill Trapp, yep. who was in a different room. Yep. And you were in a room, and I could see you into the next studio from where I was on the air. Yeah. And we, and we all three of us managed to keep it together till midnight. Yeah. You know. And play all the commercials, too. Yeah. You know, but I remember that was probably one of the busiest nights I ever had on radio, oh, yeah. man. I'll tell you, you know. Yeah, I'm sure. I always wondered if anybody over at TRU uh, gave Bill Trapp a hard time about that. Because well, he was already, he was at he had True already, reti- he had already retired anyway. Yeah, you know? that's true. But he was he was at TRU for what? He was forever. Well, I, I always thought he was news in Muskegon. Well, he know? was. He was the legend. He, there, there was a guy at KBZ named John Graska. Yes, John. And, and he was very good, too. Yes, he was. Yeah. Yep, very good. Um, who was the morning guy uh, at True when, when Trap was there? Stan Wallace. Well, Stan Wallace did afternoon drive. And then he did mornings. Okay, he did mornings. Before, but before oh, him, man. the guy that was there for years. Um, I can't drag it out of my head. Oh, <laughs> uh, and I'm... I'm spacing right uh, now, and I, I know him because he was actually up in Duluth Radio when I moved up there. He oh, was okay. working for one of the stations, and he passed away about uh, 15 years ago. I he was can't from recall. northern Minnesota, actually, originally. I can't recall his name. Oh, and I'm embarrassed to say I can't either, and I'll, it'll occur to me after this interview. You'll be eating over. dinner tonight, and you'll yeah, think go, of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, right. But Bill Trapp and, and did the news in the morning, and, and I remember... At those days, that WTRU in the morning, supposedly, this was pre-Arbitron days, right? But according to, I think it was Pulse. Was there the, was Pulse and Hooper. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and they said they claimed they had a 60 share I in believe morning it. drive, and they might have. Well, I remember when, when they, they We're would. We're talking early 60s. Well, they, I remember 64. they would have NBC News at the top of the hour yes. for five minutes. Yep. Then they'd play some spots. Yep. Then Bill Trapp would come with the news. Yep. More commercials. Yep. Trapp would come back with some sports. Right. And then more commercials. And then the, the local morning guy, the morning guy, he would do the weather. And I think you were lucky if you heard two or three records <laughs> an hour in morning In the drive. morning drive, yep. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Oh, I can't believe I can't think of that guy's but name. But then, I, the alternative, though, when I got to MUS in 78, here's Jim Cox doing mornings. Right. And we did not do local news. Right. 
I would rip Michigan headlines off the wire and tape them for Jim to play in the morning. I think we ran Mutual News, was it? I yes, think if I remember. Mutual News. Yeah. And then we had Mutual News and Michigan headlines, and that was the extent of our news. That was our news coverage. And that was it. And Jim had like a 30 share. You know? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he did really well. Did very well. And, of course, well. you talked about Tradio. What a fun program that was. To, uh... I'll tell you about the first shift I ever did at MUS. Okay. It was 6 to midnight on a Saturday. And I came in about an hour early. And you remember um, uh, Joe Sibley? Joe Sibley. What name do you use on the air? Jack Armstrong? Yeah, I think so. Anyway, he kind of said, this is how this works and that works. And my first hour at MUS from 6 to 7 p.m., yeah. Yeah. there was 18 minutes of commercials, tradio, and then I had to record mutual news of the bottom of the hour to play it back at five to the hour. Okay. And eight, and I had Tradio twenty minutes into my first shift there. Okay. You know. And so I hit so I play the recorded intro to Tradio. Right. And I go it was like what was it, eight calls or five minutes? I was gonna say it was eight calls. It was started or five, out or five, five minutes yeah. first, but then it went to eight calls. So I Push the first call, and the caller can't hear me. He's not responding to me. There was some little switch I forgot to flip by the phone. <laughs> you know, So here comes Jack Armstrong, and they flipped the switch. I know I was good for the rest of the show, but I just went, this was my, my first hour got over. I went, man, did I just do that? You know? <laughs> but all six hours were like that. There was, it was loaded with commercials. And, oh, yeah. And plus you had to follow the format. Yep. MUS, I always thought MUS was, what's the word, like advanced radio, if you will. It was very heavily formatted, and you had to do certain things at certain times yeah. and do the weather just like this. And I remember when you followed Tradio, there was a recorded outro to Tradio. Mm -hmm. And it said, MUS Tradio. Then you had to at least have a minimum five-second intro, fast record. Right. And it, yep. it, you had to hit that just right. Yep. Or you had to hit the song under the ID or, or whatever. And it was just like... When I got done with that first show, I thought like I'd worked. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this was supposed to be fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, it got to be fun after I got in the groove, but that was I always called MUS Advanced Radio because it was. Yeah. You know. Let's let's wind this all up by asking you one final question here. Go ahead. Looking ahead to radio broadcasting future, where's it headed? Where's the industry headed? I have a feeling that it's going to be a lot of it's going to just go to streaming. And internet, there a lot of people are thinking, why am I spending all this electricity and maintenance for all these transmitters? Mm -hmm. That's where I see it going. Yeah. TV too, in my opinion. All of it. Yeah, I mean, eighty percent of, or more than eighty percent of television viewing now is either cable or satellite, or people are streaming it. Right. You know. Right. I think down the road, a lot of these broadcasters are going to say, why am I? all this expense with these transmitters and towers and everything else. I think it's going to go away. That's that, my opinion. That kind of goes in line with like the newspaper industry. Well, uh, internet, the magazine internet industry. killed newspapers, didn't yeah, it? Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, the television business is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Well, is there anything I forgot to ask you about or something you'd like to share that I, we should No, include? I think we're good. In a nutshell, we kind of covered it. Okay. You know? All right. I had a great interviewer, though. You yeah, well, you're a great interview, so that's the guy, guy makes running, it easy. The guy running video, he's all right, too. Yeah, know? he's a good guy. He's a good guy, yeah. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome, Chris. sir. This is great. Uh, again, uh, we will be uh, eventually soliciting uh, the audience, asking for memorabilia from uh, radio stations for our 2025 historical exhibit. I wish I had kept more. Yeah, well, you me know? too. Yeah. Uh, me too, actually. And that's, you know, you know how that goes. But I uh, do have in a frame at home my very first record I ever played on the radio. Do you really? Oh, do you yeah. remember what it was? Oh, that, I have it in a frame. Oh, so you know. Oh, I, I took, I, yeah, it was Squeeze Box by The Who. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, no this, kidding. yeah but get this. It was 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning at the Whitehall station. And I'm there, and the guy that owns the Low Power FM up at Hart, he was a teenage high school kid running the Sunday morning programs. So he got there at 6 or 7 a.m. and ran them all mm -hmm. up until 11. And it's like he's running the Lutheran hour as the last thing into 11 o'clock. And I'm talking to him. He says, man, you got a couple of minutes. You better find a song. So, okay, squeeze box. I cue it up. And uh, and so so I hit. Around the Lutheran hour? <laughs> the Lutheran hour. The Luther <laughs> yeah. 
the Lutheran hour ends. I hit the legal ID and hit squeeze box. But I never really thought about it until years later. But I thought, hey, they need more Lutherans, you know. Because so, <laughs> that song was so double entendre. You oh, know? big time. Yeah. yeah. But I'd have that actual 45. I played having it in a frame at home with the logo of the radio station and everything. You know? That's cool. Yeah, Dan Mason, he has the first record he ever played in Whitehall, too. Oh, okay. Yep, in a frame, just okay. like I've got. Yeah. I played uh, Wichita Lineman. At what station? 1520 WKJR. They actually, let, they actually let you play that there, huh? Well, they had a brief period of about, I don't know, six months or a year. They got away from religious-based programming and went to a middle-of-the-road format. Right. I was hired in at that time and uh, to do afternoons because it was an AM daytimer and because it was summer, late spring, through early fall, I would have a job. Come the end of fall, had Tim Akroff not hired me, I'd have been out of the radio business, and okay. maybe permanently. Who knows? Well, I think but, a lot of people owe their careers to Tim. Well, I, I certainly do. Yeah, I can say that without hesitation, and have told him so. Right. So, I wanted him to know. Well, he kept he kept it. me around there all those years yeah. and hired me twice. So, he was a gr- yeah, he was a great radio guy. The only thing he ever did in his career is Oscar. Osbo didn't like his air name. I did. Kim didn't. Oh, but he gave you your air name yeah. you didn't like. Wasn't it Bo? Yeah. yeah and you said Bo you were. Bo what? Bo Oscar. Oh, Bo, Bo Oscar. Oscar. I remember You said that, you were yeah. very fond of that name. So, anyway. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank I you. appreciate it. And uh, this was fun. Thanks it was. for doing this. Thank you. Sorry it took so long to get around to doing it, by the yeah, way. It's all right. We're good. We, we finally got to her. <laughs> yeah. So, there we go. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Oscar, for all your help on this, buddy.